Minister, uh, before we can, uh, before a, uh, we begin, a, um, I would uh, ask a, uh, members to a, uh, adhere uh, as best they can to the social uh, uh, distancing guidance of the Government and the House of Commons uh, Commission. Please also give each other and members of staff space when seated and when entering and leaving the room. Members should send their speaking notes by email to hansard at parliament.uk. Similarly, officials should communicate electronically uh, with uh, ministers. I'm going to call Taiwu Atawani to move the motion. Thank you, Mr Mundell. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I beg to move that this House considers petition number 563380, titled Stop Work on HS2 Immediately and Hold a New Vote to Repeal the Legislation. Yeah. For convenience, I would just like to read a petition into Hansard. We ask the Parliament to repeal the, H, the High Speed Rail Bill 2016 and 2019, as MPs voted on misleading environmental, financial and timetable information provided by the Department of Transport and HS2 Limited. It failed to address the conditions of the Paris Accord and costs have arisen from 56 billion to over 100 billion. This petition was open for six months and it has gained over 150,000 signature, 459 of which are from my own constituency. As we all know, HS2 has been a topic in the public's mind since Parliament first voted it in 2009. Now, many of us represent constituencies deeply divided on this issue, and I myself... I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. The construction of branch shafts for HS2 on Adelaide Road and South Kilburn in my constituency is already causing major disruption to residents in Swiss Cottage and a part of Brent with some of the highest deprivation levels in the country in my constituency. Mm -hmm. With the projected cost of HS2 having quintupled since 2010, does my honourable friend think that the disruption, pollution and environmental damage that will be caused by this project over two decades is worth the £106 billion it's now likely to cost? I thank my honourable friend for raising such an important point and I will be coming on to that particular point. I myself have been wrestling with whether the cost of HS2, both economic and environmental, are outweighed by its benefits. I represent the West Midlands constituency of Coventry North West, where HS2 is projected to add many jobs locally, better connect our cities and bolster the regional economy. And I welcome these benefits. I further applaud any efforts to invest in clean and green public transport infrastructure such as high speed rail. Building high speed rail that connects our countries with cutting edge train technology should be something that we can all rally around. Happy to give away. I'm grateful. After, you know, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving way. Does she recall that when originally HS2 was planned, it was firstly going to go not into Curzon Street, but into Birmingham New Street, which would have given her greater connectivity, and moreover, it would have connected directly with HS1, so people could travel direct without changing trains in London, to the continent. Wouldn't that have been connectivity that she talks about? Thank you for raising such an important point and I'll be coming on to connectivity later on in my speech. However, I do have my own reservations on HS2. As somebody whose constituency contains woodlands at risk of increased pollution from HS2, I harbour concerns about the environmental damage that this particular railway will bring locally. Therefore, Mr. Mundo, I intend to use the remaining time I have to expound upon the petition's key contentions, which beg the question, should the government continue to fund HS2's construction? How would you give away? Isn't there uh, any advantage directly for uh, uh, my constituents in Northern Ireland? But what it should do, if government's following their levelling up pr process, it should be suppliers in Northern Ireland to have a chance to feed into this process. Does the Honourable Lady agree that when the Minister replies, a commitment to Northern Ireland for, for jobs should also be part of that? <laughs> uh, I thank my Honourable Friend for raising that point, and I know that he's a champion for um, his, constituency, his constituents in Northern Ireland. There are many reasons to be vocal about the benefits of HS2 if built as initially promised. In many ways, HS2 should be a green and environmentally friendly new railway. It should present an important asset in achieving net zero carbon in, in the UK, creating an alternative to emission-heavy mode of transport. 
by shifting more commuters to rail travel. Not only will carbon emission be 76% lower than those of an internal flight, but it would also be able to compete on journey time and cost. Happy to give way. Honourable friend for giving way, but we are starting to move towards the nub of the question, which is firstly that HS2 was greatly flawed in its initial assumptions about the costs and benefit. The costs have escalated, but most importantly, COVID has made a dramatic change in demand. And that's, that's at the moment, it's only 50, 60% of journeys are now being made by rail. And on intercity, it's probably even less. Doesn't this fundamentally under, un, undermine the case? And isn't there a need for a reassessment by the ministers? And could we ask the minister whether he's actually done that reassessment? Well, I hope the minister will be able to provide some um, explanations to the question asked. Happy to give way. She talks about greening the economy. Is it not the case that HS2 will allow more capacity to be there on the old Victorian network, which is currently virtually full, so we can take freight off the roads from polluting yeah. lorries and onto electric trains on the railways? Yeah. Well, that's a very contentious point. <laughs> HS2 would also emit seven times less carbon than the equivalent car journey. And I would, however, ask the government if they plan to adjust this calibration in light of the goal that the UK aims to have all electric vehicles by 2040. Economically, HS2 could bring benefits, including for my own city of Coventry. Nationwide, an estimated almost 500,000 jobs and 90,000 new homes have been pledged as part of the HS2 project. Currently, HS2's construction already supports 9,000 new jobs and has created contracts for 2,000 businesses, of which some 1,400 are small and medium-sized enterprises. Would my honourable friend... Happy to give way. very grateful to her. Given what we've just heard about the clear economic benefit and the additional connectivity, the additional capacity that HS2 will provide, does she share with me deep concern that we keep getting reports in the newspapers and elsewhere that the government is going cold on the HS2 route to Leeds because we've been given a clear commitment and does she hope, like me, that the Minister in responding to the debate today will make it absolutely clear that the government remains committed to building HS2 in full, including bringing it to Leeds. Well, that is a commitment that I am coming on to and, and going to ask the Minister to provide some more information on that. Peter uh, away. Whilst we're talking <laughs> about the economics of this, my constituent, Darren Bartlett, uh, has been suffering for over now almost four years. The land that he gave up, uh, which is a trading business that he had, gave up to HS2, who for now two and a half years, three and a half years almost now, have not done anything to make the compensation available to him. He is in dire financial situation. The HS2 people will refuse to actually make any discussion with him now at all. And he's having to remortgage not just his business problem, but also probably his property as well. Uh, I thank my honourable friend for raising such an important point. HS2 has caused um, financial strains for many people whose lives have been impacted on this. And I. Happy to give way, but I do have to continue my speech very soon, but happy to give way. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. I share many of the concerns about HS2 raised by her. These were made very clear to me when I joined constituents affected by the project earlier this year, seeing the impact of HS2 on them and the local area. In addition to the environmental issues the honourable member has raised, what keeps coming up time and time again with them is noise pollution. So does my honourable friend agree that it is long overdue for HS2 to put up noise counselling barriers, stopping the disruption that is plaguing so many constituents? Heavily oversubscribed. Those people making interventions, particularly lengthy interventions, are unlikely to catch my eye for the debate itself. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mundell, and I will try not to uh, take any more interventions. Um, the benefits that I have just outlined are dependent on the government following through on the entire project. Just earlier this summer, as highlighted, as highlighted by my honourable friend, the Department of Transport directed HS2 to stop all work on the leg linking Birmingham with East Midlands, Sheffield and Leeds. 
And I know that the government has made effort to quell rumours that this leg of HS2 will be, will be scrapped, but they have not issued any outright denial of that possibility. This certainly brings into doubt some of the predicted economic benefits of constructing HS2. To be clear, the government's business case for HS2 depends upon building the entire net railway network, not just fragments of HS2 for the favoured few. Failing to do so would not just break the government's promise regarding the returns on HS2, but destroy their promise on levelling up the West Midlands, or the Midlands as a whole. They must be clear about which part of HS2 will in fact be constructed so that MPs have all the facts. The potential benefits of HS2 have, as evidenced by this petition, often been overshadowed by the controversies over how the government has managed this major project so far. The petition references the extraordinary increase in the bill to build HS2. Now, back in 2009, the projected cost was £37.5 billion. By 2020, that figure has ballooned to £107.7 billion. This is an increase of 361%. This hike is before much of the construction has even begun. Now, this is completely unacceptable. And how in the world, Mr. Mundell, did this even happen? Now, a review by the National Audit Office concluded that the key reason why the price of HS2 skyrocketed was the government's failure to accurately estimate how cheaply and quickly it could build HS2 and the constantly changing scope of the project. This project has in many ways clearly been mismanaged and there are no guarantees that the cost of this project will not continue to rise. Due to time, um, I, would like, I would like to proceed quickly and then I'll give way later on. There, there are no guarantees that the cost of this project will not continue to rise and I'm deeply concerned that the taxpayer will not be able to receive the promised returns on their investment if this cost continues to climb. Now, the taxpayer is already seeing a diminished, a diminished estimation on that return. Indeed, the initial economic case in 2011 presented a benefit cost ratio for the full, network train, full train network that is nearly twice the current estimated returns. The cost and benefit to the taxpayer must be at the forefront of our minds during this debate. Separate to this is a very legitimate concern about the cost of of constructing HS2, and I would like to briefly talk about the cost of using HS2 as well. One of the, one of the main reasons why I'd originally um, had some hope for the construction of HS2 was with the understanding that a high-speed rail link such as this would not only provide better mobility for commuters, but it would improve social mobility as well. However, if the only people who are able to take HS2 are the wealthiest amongst us, then I cannot see how it will be used as a tool to boost social mobility. Oh. I'll now suspend the sitting for 15 minutes. The sitting is suspended for 15 minutes. Order, order. The sitting is resumed. The debate will now continue until 7.45 p.m. and I call on Taiwu Otoami to conclude her remarks. Thank you, Mr. Mundell. Can I give way? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm happy to give way and this is the last time I will be giving way. I sincerely thank my honourable friend for taking my intervention as I would like to draw members' attention to the substantial impact and disruption caused to residents in my constituency on vent shaft works associated with tunnelling under Ely North. I recently carried out a survey of residents on Car Road and Badminton Close in Northall and I would welcome my honourable friend's support in asking the Minister to review the survey results and join me in pushing HS2 to improve their communication and accountability to residents. I thank my honourable friend for raising such an important point that I will just be coming on to. I am deeply concerned about the environmental destruction this project is having on ancient woodland areas. The Woodland Trust estimates that 108 ancient woodland areas are at risk of loss or damage as a result of construction on HS2. And the irreparable damage to an ancient woodland ecosystem and biodiversity cannot be adequately addressed by replanting a few saplings over the course of a few years or generations. These environmental concerns alone give me a pause for thought. If HS2 is to be anything close to a success story, then it must change course. I'm worried that this project will continue with the same mismanagement that has characterised the construction so far, increased 
the projected construction time by about 10 years and increase HS2 projection, projected costs by over £60 billion. Pounds. The same mistakes will continue to plague other phases as well unless we see change. HS2 Limited needs to be much better at listening to the communities that it's most impacting, taking the time to allow contractors to weigh in on what truly works best for local communities. Finally, I want to touch upon a larger issue at stake, and this is the issue of public trust. When we consider new and ambitious infrastructure projects, the public must trust the government will be open, will be trans transparent, trustworthy, cost-effective and efficient. With HS2, that has all too often not been the case. And I worry that diminished public faith in the government's ability to effectively manage projects like this will prevent them from supporting positive and ambitious infrastructure projects in the future. Mr Mundell, the end does not always justify the means. And I want to conclude my opening remarks by saying that I look forward to hearing from the government on how they plan to address some of the important concerns that I've raised today. And I also hope to hear more for what MPs across the House today will be raising and their ideas on how to drastically improve HS2 project. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition uh, 563380 uh, relating to HS2. I'm going to impose a three minute uh, limit on contributions and I'm going to call Jeremy Wright to begin the debate. Your chairmanship and to speak in this debate, and I'm grateful to the Petitions Committee for bringing it to this chamber. And I agree with a great many of the concerns which have already been expressed about HS2. For what it's worth, Mr. Mundell, I always argued that the line should follow existing transport corridors, which would have done a lot less environmental damage. But nonetheless, since legislative authority was given for the line as it stands, with a few individual exceptions, I'm afraid that HS2 Limited has acted too often in a thoughtless and high-handed way, failing to communicate effectively on the nature of their works and the road closures and other disruption that they cause. Yeah, yeah. As we've heard, the budget has risen dramatically without anyone seemingly held to account for it, and yet in so many of the compensation cases I've dealt with, every penny claimed by vulnerable people whose lives have been ruined by the line has been fiercely contested. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Mr. Mandel, I welcome the appointment of a dedicated HS2 minister, and my honourable friend has been doing a good job of getting to grips with these issues. But he will agree that there is much more to do, and there is much more of the construction phase to go. HS2 Limited and its contractors have to work much harder to talk to and listen to local residents affected by their work, and my right honourable my honourable friend and they need to do more to answer legitimate challenges about compliance with environmental standards and about what was known when about cost overruns. Uh, I will give way. I really appreciate the member giving way. Isn't it the case that the criteria outlined by the previous speaker about honesty? transparency, value for money and openness, that it has failed the test on all of those things and that the rocketing costs makes people feel that they're on a runaway train that hasn't even, mm. if you like, had the opportunity to get out of the station. This is a mess and it must be fixed. I, I think the honourable gentleman is right and I think that it is now incumbent on everybody involved in the project, including the government, to make improvements in those respects and, and we must expect that that will now happen. Um, but there is, as we've discussed, much to criticise HS2 for, but this petition does not ask us to criticise HS2, but to cancel it. And on that question, it seems to me we should not be making a judgement based entirely on frustration, considerable though it may be. The reality is that legislative authority for HS2 has already been given, and this debate does not provide a re mechanism to reverse it. And even if it did... Given the amount already spent and the work already done on phase one, it's likely that any cancellation decision now would be to cancel phase two of the line, not phase one, which passes through my constituency and I know through others. That would leave us with a high-speed rail line from London to Birmingham, with all the inconvenience caused to my constituents to build it, but not to the wider network. And the positive case for a wider network can be made. The positive case, I'm afraid for a new London to Birmingham line cannot. So stopping after phase one seems to me 
to be almost the worst case scenario for my constituents and I cannot support it. But Mr Mundell, if HS2 is to proceed, my honourable friend will need to assure us that it will be delivered with more efficiency, with more flexibility and with more consideration for the people impacted by it than I'm afraid we've largely seen so far. Yeah, yeah. So thank the Petitions Committee for bringing forward today's debate and the 311 constituents of mine who have also petitioned. The government needs to get a grip of this project. That has come over loud and clear in the debate so far and no doubt will be echoed for the next hour or so. If I look at the impact on my constituency, not only are we in the midst of a climate emergency, but also an environmental emergency, and we cannot plough lines through the midst of these cathedrals to nature at the same time when we are avoiding uh, wonderful cathedrals such as the destination city that this train HS2 is meant to arrive at at some date in the future and we know not when. And therefore the paths that these lines should take should be first of all integrated with the rest of the network but also and in short, I'm, I'm happy to give way briefly. Isn't the effect of what's happening with HS2 means that, that we're getting further delays on us getting Northern Powerhouse Rail, which is hugely important for the connectivity across the north of England and other rail projects. Well, I agree that the sequencing of this project needs to be re-examined because we need that interconnectivity and therefore to see that mapped into the rest of our rail system. But the issue I want to particularly focus on is the impact this is having on the economy of York, the plans. Let me point out, Mr Mundell, in Crewe, we're talking about 36,000 jobs. Curzon Street, 37,000 jobs. Yes, in York, just 6,500 jobs adjacent to the rail system. On network rail land. This is rail land which comes under the minister's department. And I want to have this question answered today. Why the economic opportunity which the minister has espoused about HS2 is not translating into reality because network rail are going to redevelop that, how, that land for luxury apartments. Not that anybody in my constituency can live in them, but so that people can commute down to London, sucking out the wealth from my constituency. That does not make economic sense. It does not make transport sense and at a cost to our environment. And therefore, this project needs to re-examine its purpose. But the minister also has a responsibility to ensure that jobs come into my city. There's no point talking about spending all this money if it's not going to drive up the opportunity for my constituents. And therefore, I ask the minister to take a look, look at those figures when we see that housing, 2,500 units, are going to be put on that site adjacent to the, the station, which my constituents just simply can't afford because of the low cost of living. Pushing out that job opportunity at the same time as saying that's the whole purpose of this railway does not make sense. So if we look at the economic suction that it's going to bring to the north, and in my, my constituency, added to the environmental impact that it's going to have, I have to say to the minister that he hasn't yet presented a case which um, stacks up to say that HS2 is going to benefit places like York. So I ask him to look at that again. Finally, if I can, Mr Mundell, if we are looking at truly levelling up, we have to look at all of those opportunities of interconnectivity. In the north, we need to see Sheffield, Leeds, Manchester and York as part of that rail network with proper integration, proper speeds. And that simply is not happening either. If we look at the east-west route, it is far too slow and far too um, costly for my constituents to be able to get the real benefit from. So we've got to see this connectivity across the network before this project proceeds, not least as we know that people have changed the way that they're moving about our country and at a time when we really do need to ensure that we invest in the, really, in the things that are really going to increase our productivity. Thank you. Greg Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr Mundell. It is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I stand with the petitioners calling for HS2 to be scrapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Firstly, on cost grounds. At a time when the state is reaching deeper into people's pockets, I put it to this House that it is obscene to keep throwing money into this unwanted project. Yeah. 
The latest estimate for the total cost is £146 billion. Pounds. That is ten times the original estimate. And would you also agree that COVID has completely changed likely travel patterns and the big commuting demand is going to be much reduced? So where is the argument for capacity, which was what the whole thing was meant to be about? Uh, I'm grateful for my right honourable friend's intervention, and he has read my mind, a point that I will come to shortly in my remarks. But firstly, the National Audit Office has noted that 50% of the costs for Phase 1 are still based on HS2 Limited's estimates, consultant designs, benchmarking information, rather than actual costs, real pounds and pence, agreed with industry, so that the overall cost could quite clearly rise again. And likewise, HS2's own revised cost estimates assume that they'll be able to find £2.8 billion worth of savings, yet there has been a substantial dip into their contingency budgets already. We all know that the case for HS2 was ropey to start with. Some estimated only a 66 pence return for every taxpayer pound spent. And if rumours of the eastern leg being scrapped are true, that must surely make the business case utterly untenable. Then, as my right honourable friend for Wokingham said earlier, there is the aftermath of COVID. Mm. The Transport Select Committee heard last year that rail passenger numbers are unlikely to recover to more than three quarters of 2019's levels. Other estimates have it as low as 47%. Surely, the pandemic and new working patterns should allow for fresh eyes on high speed too although I fear the cat was somewhat let out of the bag by Doug Okavy, who at the Transport for the North Annual Conference last year was quoted as saying the construction industry was in a very fragile position, going on to justify his recommendation as preventing harm to the construction industry. That is a purely unacceptable rationale. Which leads me on to environmental destruction. Hedgerows, trees, nature reserves like Calvert Jubilee in my constituency destroyed. Water quality at risk, wildlife at risk. Environmental standards that were agreed now not being met as well documented by the Chilterns Conservation Board and the Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust. And now in my constituency we have uncovered evidence of limestone being applied to land taken which will render it useless for any future agricultural use. No prizes for guessing what the end game is there. There is more to this gravy train than just the train. <laughs> Worst of all, it brings real human misery to my constituents and constituents up and down the line of route. The endless road closures, the destruction of local rural roads to conditions that are just not safe to travel on, the grossly unfair way that landowners and farmers are treated, people being left in a state of severe stress and anxiety, not knowing what is going to happen to their land and their homes and their businesses, not for days and weeks, but for months and years. And I'm devastated to tell this House that from among the hundreds of people in this state of stress and anxiety, there have now been cases of people suffering heart attacks and losing their lives, which I fear is not a coincidence. So let's look at the reality. Let's call time on HS2 right now and end this waste of money and destructive project. Yeah. Sarah Green. Thank you, Mr. Mandel, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. My constituents have made no secret of how important this issue is to them. That is why it doesn't surprise me that so many residents of Cheshire and Amersham put their name to this petition. I would like to join their plea to stop HS2 by putting on record my own opposition to it. I've had hundreds of emails about this debate alone. That's without the various emails and meetings I've had raising specific concerns around the construction now taking place. I could fill the time available to us listing those concerns, but I will resist. What many locally hoped would not happen now is happening, and as far as they're concerned, it's happening to them. Which is why it doesn't surprise me that the highest number of signatories to this petition are from Chesham and Amersham. Out of the daily correspondence I receive on this issue, what strikes me is the persistent lack of trust in HS2 Limited. This lack of trust is openly acknowledged by the team at HS2, 
And they have assured me more than once that they're working hard to address that with the local community. But we've been here before. Five years ago, in December 2016, a House of Lords Select Committee special report highlighted their concerns about community engagement. Three years later, the Oakerby Review said something similar. I would therefore ask the Minister if he is satisfied that he is seeing enough improvement in this area from HS2 Limited. This lack of trust is now inevitably compounded by the day-to-day -day reality of the largest infrastructure project in Europe happening on our doorstep. And let's not forget that those affected have years of this to look forward to, a decade of debilitating disruption. I would like to finish with the very real fears for the aquifer and the water supply. The Minister will be aware of concerns around the use of bentonite. Indeed, in July 2018, my predecessor asked whether there was a plan to use bentonite under pressure when tunnelling under the Chilterns. The reply she received from the Minister at the time was as follows. Bentonite will be used in the construction of the diaphragm walls for the five intermediate shafts. Prior to the use of bentonite in these locations, the construction methodology dictates that the ground... Sur surrounding the diaphragm walls will be grouted, therefore sealing and protecting the groundwater from the bentonite. But the Minister will know that it has come to light that during diaphragm wall excavation at the Chalfont St Peter vent shaft late last year, there was a significant loss of bentonite. There is a clear correlation between this loss and changes in water quality in the area. HS2 Limited chose not to share this information with the community. We only know about it because of a freedom of information request submitted to the Environment Agency. The last thing local campaigners want to say is, I told you so. So I asked the Minister directly, will he come and hear from those residents whose fears for our water supply are real and have not been allayed by the assurances they've received to date? Given the repeated calls for increased transparency and openness over the years, I'd ask the Minister to come and meet with some of my constituents and decide for himself if HS2 Limited's commitment to openness and transparency is being fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Sir William Cash. I've always voted against HS2 from its inception. My constituents have agreed with me and I'm grateful for the support of the member for Stafford in this debate. Um, I have yet to see any objective report supporting it and it has been on, put on red watch, red watch by the government's own, own uh, economic advisers. The company has continued to spend billions of pounds of taxpayers' money as it takes a wrecking ball through some of our most beautiful countryside and woodlands and devastates communities. The voters of Chesham and Amersham let the government know in no uncertain terms how they felt, and they are not alone. The HS2 seems to have learned nothing about respecting the knowledge of local people. The company has repeatedly treated my constituents with contempt and refused to engage in meaningful consultation, paying lip service by pl planting a few new trees, putting in footpaths and glossy events. When HS2 has met with communities, they've stubbornly refused to listen to them and when technically challenged on its responses, have gone to extraordinary lengths to conceal the engineering weaknesses of their own. HS2 must admit the lack of engineering feasibility this represents. HS2 should also listen to the massive advantages presented by the professional and forensic analysis from my constituents, which have been made available to the government, which will dramatically reduce constructive impacts on Staffordshire, North Shropshire and Cheshire during the trans transaction of 2A and Phase 2B, deliver a valuable engineering asset that could build and maintain the western leg of HS2, and save the taxpayer approximately £600 million from the HS2 budget, which could be reinvested, please note the Treasury, please note, which could be reinvested on local rail projects that would transform rail connectivity across the north and through the Midlands to the east coast and provide the economic boost that these, this, these parts of the country richly deserve, including the levelling up agenda. I have absolutely no doubt that this is a disastrous white elephant, but there are opportunities, there are means whereby the Minister can change course and I'd strongly recommend that he does. Yeah. 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 Stringer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mandel. These are the 
arguments uh, that have been put forward against HS2 uh, were very similar to the arguments put forward by the stagecoach owners uh, against the original investment in, in the railway system. That's re relevant to this debate, uh, Mr. Mundell, because one of the problems we have is, although the stagecoach owners didn't win the argument 200 years ago, over the years, the equivalent arguments have stopped investment in infrastructure in this country. We have the lowest mouse away density in what used to be called Western Europe. We, have, we are still relying on that railway system uh, that the Victorians uh, built for us. And the fact is that railway system is inadequate. And because it's inadequate, we have more cars on congested motorways uh, creating uh, pollution and potentially many uh, collisions. So my constituents and most of the north of England uh, have supported HS2 because of the uh, economic benefits uh, that it gives. And in actual fact, I don't believe it's ambitious enough. I think rather than putting HS2 trains on the current railway lines to go to Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, Scottish MPs and Northern MPs should be demanding that HS2 goes directly to Scotland and is joined, as the uh, original uh, speaker said, to HS1. That was part of the original view. We have not been ambitious enough uh, in our investment in infrastructure in the past and uh, currently. I just want to deal, before I finish, Mr. Mundell, with two or three of the arguments that are being put forward. The most absurd argument is the COVID argument. Mm -hmm. This is a project that will last 100 years, or maybe 200 years, like the current uh, railway system does. COVID, hopefully, will be over much more quickly uh, than that, over the next six months, 12 months, uh, and uh, we can get back to a normal economy and transport system. It is often, the second point, it is often counterpoised uh, that the Liverpool Hull Railway, HS3, it's been called many uh, things, uh, should be given priority over HS2. Both are required. One will feed into the other. Uh, if you disperse passengers off HS2, they'll need to go on to a line with capacity uh, uh, between Liverpool and Hull, and vice versa, you need to feed into uh, that uh, position. So, uh, of course I will. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. And will he also agree with me that this is about freight? We can only expect freight movements uh, to increase, and we want them to get off the roads and onto the railway, and that will only be possible if we create the extra capacity that HS2 will give us. Yeah. My honourable friend, of course, is right from her experience uh, and expertise as a previous chair of the Transport uh, Committee. Of course, uh, HS2 not only frees up capacity for passengers, it frees up capacity for freight. And that will uh, take pollution off our motorways uh, in all sorts of different ways. So, I, this petition I am opposed to. It isn't going to have any impact. It allows uh, MPs to voice their constituents' concern. But HS2 and an, uh, an expanded HS2 is important for the future of this country. Thank you. your chairmanship uh, and I'm very grateful to the petitions committee for securing this debate because HS2 is undoubtedly the single biggest issue in my constituency of Aylesbury. Indeed 2,999 petitioners are from my constituency, second only to those from Cheshire and Amersham and I've received more than 400 emails asking me to speak today. I completely share the views of the vast majority of residents across the Aylesbury constituency that HS2 should be scrapped. As I stated at the very beginning of my own election campaign, I do not believe we need this railway. It makes no sense economically with a weak business case and dramatically escalating construction costs. It makes no sense environmentally with more than 100 ancient woodlands being destroyed for a line that will never be carbon neutral over the course of its 120 year lifespan. I remain absolutely convinced that the scheme will do enormous damage to our area with zero benefit to the people of Aylesbury and the nearby villages. 
Let's take some examples. The residents of Stoke Mandeville and Fairford Lees are already impacted by the construction work that is underway. Aylesbury itself is at risk of flooding because some of the methods HS2 Limited insists on using despite repeated pleas to do more to alleviate the peril. Indeed, a recent FOI inquiry revealed an alarming lack of detailed knowledge of the impact on the aquifer of HS2's construction. The popular and beautiful village of Wendover will be more directly affected by the first phase of the HS2 project than any rural settlement of comparable size. Those aren't my words. That's a direct quote from the House of Lords Select Committee. And one key way of mitigating the horrendous consequences of HS2 for Wendover would be the construction of a bored mined tunnel. Time and again, local residents have provided compelling evidence of the case for such a tunnel. But time and again, they've been told they can't have it. So they've asked for a full, thorough, and independent analysis of their proposal versus the one in the consented scheme. And even for that, again, they've been told no. It is hardly surprising that they are up in arms. Of course, we shouldn't need a tunnel in Wendover because we shouldn't have HS2 at all. There are so many things the HS2 budget could be better spent on. I have three suggestions. Local train lines, both across the north of England and indeed in my own constituency. Notably, the Aylesbury link of East West Rail, which has a better business case than HS2, would dramatically cut traffic congestion on the roads and reduce environmental harm. But we are still waiting for funding approval. Or we could use the money for high-speed broadband, which would enable the new ways of working that are now becoming embedded following the pandemic. Parts of my constituency still struggle to get Wi-Fi, despite being less than 50 miles from central London. Or indeed, we could just save some of the huge bill, given the hundreds of billions of pounds we've had to borrow in the past 18 months. Any of those options would be much better for my constituency and for the country than this painful, lumbering white elephant project. Yeah. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr. Lander. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. The government's response to this petition states that HS2 will, and I quote, leave a long-lasting legacy for both wildlife and future generations. Well, yes, it certainly will. A long-lasting legacy of environmental annihilation, eye-watering expense, and broken promises. Now, today, I want to focus on the environmental harm of HS2, and I'd point out that almost 600 Brighton constituents have signed this petition. Because if you can't make a convincing case for a new railway on environmental grounds, that shows just how fundamentally flawed this scheme must be. We are facing a climate and ecological emergency, and we need to start acting like it. Only if there is overwhelmingly positive environmental cases for HS2 should it go ahead, and clearly there are not. However, there are, as we've already heard this evening, many genuinely greener alternatives where such large sums of money could and should be invested in the UK's transport system. To give just one more example, the New Economics Foundation estimate that a National Rail Investment Fund of 55.2 billion over the next 10 years, just over half the cost of HS2, including 18.9 billion allocated to the north of England, would help commuters speed up long distance journeys, cut carbon emissions, and bring benefits to many regions that aren't even served by HS2. Now, on nature, the government response to the petition says that there will be no net loss to biodiversity. Well, even if that were meaningful or credible, and it is frankly neither, it is utterly inadequate. The wildlife trusts have highlighted how ancient woodland is, and I quote, by its very nature, irreplaceable. So an ancient wood that is lost to HS2 is a permanent loss for nature and wildlife. Yet 15 hectares of ancient woodland over 400 years old has already been obliterated. It speaks volumes that HS2 keeps no record of the individual number of trees felled. So I would like to ask the minister tonight, can he provide the figure of the total number of trees felled? I think that would be very interesting. And finally, on climate, the Department for Transport response to the petition claims HS2 will, and I quote, play a vital role in delivering the government's carbon net zero objectives. Yet HS2's own forecasts, even over 120 years, show the project will call, cause carbon emissions of 1.49 million tonnes. Achieving our climate goals means rapidly decarbonising the whole transport system and protecting and restoring habitats like woodland. HS2 does neither. Frankly, the way that we're trying to make these decisions does no justice to the seriousness of the environmental harm at stake. HS2 shows we need a fundamental change in economic decision-making and in criteria for major infrastructure projects. 
we urgently need to give top priority to the health and well-being of people and nature. It's time to stop annihilating nature in the name of short-term financial gain for some rather big construction corporations and the pursuit of infinite economic growth on our finite and fragile planet. The petitioners are right. HS2 should be scrapped. Dr. Kieran Mullen. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. When I became a candidate for Crew and Nine Twitch in 2018, this was one of the big decisions for me. Did I or didn't I support HS2? And I can tell you, it wasn't well-paid lobbyists or government or business interests that convinced me. It was knocking on the doors and speaking to dozens of men and women who lived locally, who worked on the railways locally, and who told me how vital this project was. So whilst I recognise very many of the concerns raised by members, and I hope HS2 is listening to them, I support this project. Crewe has a proud and close relationship with its, this country's railways. It was actually just a village until the locomotive works and the railway station were founded in the 1830s. And it's built on this industrial heritage to forge a new future as a home for a wide variety of businesses, but still with the railway at its heart. But that future is at risk if we cannot deliver locally on improving links via the railway. People have raised the issue of reduced capacity as a result of COVID. It's important to note that already on some routes, we're back up to 70% of, of uh, pre-pandemic travel levels. And I think it would be unwise to make major decades-long decisions about transport in this country on the basis of less than a few years uh, of, of travel patterns yeah. that I fully expect to return to normal. Uh, the West Coast Main Line, I think, will return to being the busiest mixed roast, mixed use railway line in Europe and that means locally for my residents and businesses no capacity for, for freight, congested timetables, fewer smaller local journeys because intercity journeys take, take uh, priority. And I know the answer for some is to just upgrade what we have. And I would remind everybody that the last time we did that, we faced the same cost overruns and delays that, that we are seeing in HS2. I've, I've said before in this house, I don't think arguments about our ability to deliver big infrastructure are valid for not delivering big infrastructure. We have to get better at doing infrastructure. We have to listen to MPs as we're delivering projects to get them better. We don't say no. If we just stand still, we're certainly not going to deliver an improvement in our ability to, to improve our infrastructure locally. So I, I recognise the concerns, and I also want to, to flag the context of the money that we're spending. This is a lot of money, but let's keep in mind that we already plan to spend £6 billion a year on maintaining and making much smaller upgrades across the railway network, and we plan to spend £40 billion on the next five years of, on projects outside of HS2. So I think within the context of those figures, to think that we can build a major new railway line without very substantial forms of public investment is naive. And so are we really saying that we're not in this country ever going to build a big, major new railway line? I don't think that's wise. I don't think that reflects the ambition we have for my part of the UK and for all of the North and the rest of the country, which HS2 helps deliver on. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine McKinnell. Thank you, Adele. The government talks about levelling up, and there can be few more glaring examples of regional inequality than our rail infrastructure and few where the role of central government is so critical, which is why I've been campaigning for some time for greater connectivity to and between major northern cities via the East Coast Main Line, but HS2 matters too, and particularly the eastern leg. If the government is serious about investing in the north, it must build and integrate all phases of HS2, along with Northern Powerhouse Rail, and deliver major upgrades to the East Coast Main Line. I know from some of the emails I've received ahead of this debate that many people want to see HS2 scrapped, and investment in local rail links in the north prioritised instead. I understand those concerns, and we absolutely need to correct the chronic underinvestment in North East Transport Network, but it shouldn't be an either-or proposition. Nobody would argue that London could only have one major infrastructure project at any one time, and neither should the North. Moreover, the primary purpose of HS2 is to free up capacity, as honourable members have said, on the existing lines. Without it, we will struggle to improve local commuter and freight services. Our existing lines struggle to keep up with pre-pandemic levels of demand, and they won't be able to accommodate more or longer trains. We need a significant, coherent programme of rail infrastructure investment across the north of England, and that includes delivering HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail in full, and improvements to existing lines, particularly the East Coast Main Line. If the government's intention is simply to build 21st century rail links between London and Birmingham, while passengers and businesses in the north are left behind, it will make an absolute mockery of levelling up. So I hope the minister will reassure us today that that is not his intention. And I go back again to the 
need for investment in the East Coast Main Line, if the eastern leg of HS2 goes ahead, and I hope it does, it will deliver a continuous new high-speed railway between London and the Midlands and junction with the East Coast Main Line in North Yorkshire. However, from that point on, it's envisaged that HS2 trains will travel on existing East Coast Main Lines to serve the North East and beyond. The line carried 15 million passengers from the North East each year prior to the pandemic. It's used for long distance, regional, local passenger trains and freight services, but it has just two tracks. It suffers from chronic capacity issues. It affects the reliability of existing services and stymies the potential to add further services. The single congested track between North Allerton and Newcastle is one of the worst examples of capacity problems um, on the East Coast Main Line. So after decades of underinvestment and a failed piecemeal approach to rail infrastructure in the north, the government has an opportunity here to invest in capacity and connectivity, attract investment and truly boost the north by delivering HS2, NPR and East Coast upgrades. Esther McVeigh. Thank you, Mr. And I want to start by saying that the time allocated to the debate today is woefully short. And I have to say that adds to the sense that the public has that people aren't listening to them, they are being silenced, and this government doesn't want to listen to opposition to HS2. Yeah, yeah. Nearly yeah. 2,000 people in Tatton signed the petition, and I stand fairly and squarely with them, and the other thousands and thousands of people to say, stop HS2, and a little bit later, I'll give you a reason why that vote needs to be heard again and had again in the House of Commons. I would like to mention a few groups and people from Tatton because they have worked tirelessly unearthing the failings of HS2. And that's Ashley Parish Council, Latch Dennis and Lockstock Green Parish Council, Mid Cheshire against HS2, Cathy O'Donoghue and Ross Todd Hunter for her technical expertise. Now many colleagues have talked about the failings and there isn't just one failing, there are many. In fact, the more you look into this project, the worse it gets. From its ballooning costs to the destruction of land and countryside to it being an out-of-date project, we need high-speed broadband, one gigabit capability, yeah, 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 yeah. which would connect with everyone everywhere, not HS2. And let, let's talk about the cost. It was 37 and a half billion. It's now 150 billion pounds. I want to ask the minister, a scheme might be viable at 37 and a half billion pounds, maybe even at 50 billion pounds. But when does it become unviable? Or is this government saying they are going to pay for it, whatever the cost? So I'd like to bring up the very serious point brought up by Lord Barclay in the other place on the 9th of September, and he said this. He'd received information from senior managers in HS2, I think you'd call them whistleblowers. They had produced a detailed estimate of this project from the beginning, which was news to him because they'd always denied that. But they have an estimate and the problem is this. It came out at 48 billion at a time when ministers were telling the House of Commons and your Lordship's house the cost was 23.5 billion. It was on the basis of that cost, 23.5 billion, it was voted through the House. If that is the case, isn't it right if we were given misinformation, that vote needs to be heard again and had yeah, again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my final questions in the, minute, in the moments I've got are, one, what is the cost to cancel this scheme? And on what is that estimate made? On what measurements does HS2 level up the north? And finally, can we look at that serious allegation in the House of Lords? And if it's true, have another vote. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret Greenwood. Ms Mundell, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Um, more than 155,000 people have signed the petition that we're discussing today, including around 200 of my constituents in Wirral West. Some have written to me directly, raising their concerns about the spiralling costs of HS2 and its impact on the environment and climate emergency, and I share these concerns that they have. As members have observed, travel patterns have changed significantly over the course of the pandemic, and businesses have adapted to new ways of connecting over the internet. 
With more people working remotely, it's important that the government revisits the arguments that were originally put forward for HS2. And I would ask the member who argues strongly against this to reflect on the opportunities that the internet offers to businesses in the way that they operate going forward and the generations coming through who are so adept at using that, those technologies and developing them. I would also say that if the government wishes to encourage greater use of rail by passengers, they should take action on the very high costs of train tickets, particularly at peak times, which frankly are prohibitive. In response to a written question that I tabled to the minister, uh, in May of this year, the minister said there's significant uncertainty around how travel patterns will change post-COVID and that the government had not yet completed modelling the sensitivity of its major project business cases to post-COVID demand. So could the minister give us an update on what the government is doing to understand these shifts in business behaviour and their impacts in the case for HS2? As we prepare to host COP26, the UK should be leading the way in the fight against climate change. In May 2019, this House declared an environment and climate emergency and called on ministers to outline urgent proposals to restore the UK's natural environment. Yet there has been no route-wide environmental impact assessment for HS2. As has been mentioned already, the Woodland Trust has pointed out that 108 ancient woodlands are at risk of loss or damage as a result of the project. The government should take urgent action to understand the environmental impacts of HS2 across the whole route. Finally, I turn to the management of the project. In its 2020-21 annual report, the Infrastructure and Projects Authority gave Phase 1, the London to West Midlands section, an amber red rating, meaning successful delivery of the project is in doubt, with major risks or issues apparent in a number of key areas. It gave Phase 2B of HS2, which would extend the line to Manchester and Leeds, a red rating, meaning that successful delivery of the project appears to be unachievable. It's clear that High Speed 2, the government's flagship national transport project, is in chaos. The climate crisis is real and it is here and it is with us today. The financial costs of the projects have spiralled and work patterns are changing. So I urge the Minister to give very serious attention to these most pressing concerns and I look forward to hear his responses today. I'm Andrea Leadsom. This project first came to my attention back in 2009, when it seemed that to make up for rejecting a third runway at Heathrow, my party manifesto pledged to consult on this massive white elephant. So as a new backbencher, back in 2011, I led a debate begging the government to look again at the economic case for the project then. HS2's heroic forecasting of up to 4% year-on-year passenger growth was even then undermined by the experience of HS1 that had achieved less than half its forecast. The economic case for HS2 had assumed that all time spent on a train was wasted, so a 20-minute time-saving between Birmingham and London could account for huge economic gain. The green credentials of HS2 assumed that the power required to run it would be 100% generated through renewable sources. And at the time, the cost was forecast to be $32 billion, with HS2 opening by 2026. So where are we now? Train passenger increases bottomed out long before COVID. Everybody can now work on a train using Wi-Fi, and government figures show the costs of the project have exponentially risen to well over £100 billion. And here we are in 2021 with enabling work only just begun. The paving bill got royal assent in November 2013, effectively giving HS2 a blank cheque. I was one of 38 who voted against it. And then we set up a compensation and mitigation forum with a number of MPs who were determined to protect their constituencies. At the time, we were all promised that no expense would be spared to ensure that our communities and countryside were looked after. Well, how wrong that proved to be. Yeah. The toll on lives and livelihoods has been massive. Andy, Ben, Murray and Anne in Radstone have had to battle for years to get HS2 to confirm what was agreed in writing during the hybrid bill, a proper sound barrier to protect their village and a lowering of the line. Five years later, these issues are still outstanding. And Pauline and Doug, whose successful holiday business was shut down by HS2 taking their land, and four years later, they're still awaiting compensation, and they're stuck in their old home and have no income. And the beautiful village of Chipping Warden, now surrounded by construction materials that HS2 have just dumped in this lovely countryside area. 
For me as an MP dealing with what can only be described as the appalling treatment of my constituents by HS2 has taken on average 25% of my time since 2010 and it's caused real mental health issues for hundreds of local people. My honourable friend, the HS2 minister, is working very hard to help. But Mr Mundell, I'm just going to say it straight. HS2 is an appalling waste of money, and I'm ashamed of the way it's being implemented. We need a fresh vote. Yay. Robert Largan. Thank you, Mr Mundell. HS2 is probably the most poorly explained and poorly understood policy in our national discourse. Over the last decade, a series of myths have been perpetuated by a combination of muddled thinking and the efforts of well-funded self-interest groups. I welcome this opportunity to address some of those myths head-on. Firstly, despite its name, HS2 has never been simply about shaving 30 minutes off journey times down to London. It's always been about tackling the capacity challenge on the country's most important strategic railway, the West Coast Main Line. If we were to cancel HS2 and do nothing, within a few years, this most vital artery of our entire national railway network would quite simply grind to a halt, causing huge damage to our economy, especially in the North and Midlands. Now, I've seen many claim that the internet and remote working will take care of this problem all by itself, ignoring the fact that, excluding the pandemic, rail passenger figures have gone up every single year since the internet was invented. It also ignores the issue of rail freight. I'm all for harnessing technology, but with the best will in the world, you cannot deliver millions of tons of goods via Zoom. We're already seeing the consequences of being overly reliant on road haulage, with the problems caused by the continental shortage of HGV drivers. A failure to invest in our frail, rail freight capacity would only make this worse. Secondly, let's examine the cost of HS2. And let's give the anti-HS2 lobby the benefit of the doubt, take their absolute worst-case scenario cost figures at face value, and their worst-case scenario completion date at face value. We're looking at spending just over £5 billion a year. For context, that's about half of what we spend on overseas aid. It's a lot of money, but investing around 0.25% of our GDP every year for a limited period to fix the most important railway network in our country is hardly disproportionate. Thirdly, and perhaps the most common argument against HS2, is that we should be prioritising fixing existing commuter rail services instead, buying into a completely false choice narrative. After all, London wasn't forced to choose between Crossrail and Thameslink. The North and the Midlands shouldn't be forced to choose either. It also completely misses the point of HS2 to free up capacity on existing commuter lines and enable other transport improvements like Northern Powerhouse Rail. And when the Transport Select Committee visited Birmingham, we heard very compelling evidence from Andy Street on HS2 allows improvements like the Midlands Rail Hub as well. My own constituency is a good example of this. I have two railway lines which have very limited capacity that run through the, the, one of the busiest corridors in the country, Stockport to Manchester. This HS2 would free up that capacity and allow for a significant improvement in rail services for places like Buxton New Mills, Chinley and Whaley Bridge. Finally, and I believe most erroneously, a myth has developed that HS2 would be bad for the environment. If you're serious about tackling climate change and decarbonising economy, I cannot see how you can credibly oppose HS2, a project specifically designed to reduce our reliance on domestic flights to get cars and HDVs off a road, shifting people and freight from a high carbon to a low carbon form of transport. So in conclusion, completing HS2 is good for jobs, good for the economy, good for public transport and good for tackling climate change. It's vital we keep HS2 on track. Finally, I'll call Alexander Stafford if you can keep it to two minutes, Mr Stafford. Uh, I stand here to oppose HS2 as I have ever been elected, and over 700 of my constituents uh, signed the petition. And I actually was joined at one of my street surgeries this Friday, uh, just gone, by Sandra Haith, a stalwart member of the Bramley anti H2 group, who sent to me a petition that was signed by 8,000 constituents a couple of years ago. So in Rother Valley, in a northern seat, a seat the government wants to level up, we say we don't want HS2. I want to challenge this fallacy that HS2 is involved with levelling up. Quite the opposite. HS2 takes money and resources away from levelling up. Yeah. I say by putting HS2, and I'm particularly talking about the 2B arm that runs rush off through my constituency, destroying 400 homes, damages the levelling up process. And why is that? First of all, we've heard about £150 billion. What my constituency can do with £15 million would be transformative. Give us some of that. Don't give us a rail line which we can't get onto. That's what we need. On top of that, we've talked about the Trans-Pennine route here, but that's what we need. But what I'm hearing from suppliers, from construction companies, is there's not enough resources. 
There's not enough concrete. There's not enough tradesmen at the moment to actually build anything else. Because HS2 is this gaping more, sucking resources, sucking money, sucking everything, but not actually delivering anything. Mm -hmm. So this actually undermines the whole concept of levelling up. So what I want to say is to the government is we need to stop HS2. And we need to stop the 2B arm. If newspaper reports are believed, the 2B arm is going to be scrapped. And I welcome that. However, what I would like the Minister here is confirmation of that. Because hundreds of my constituents whose homes are being destroyed or compulsory purchased are being left in limbo. They don't know what's going on. We can't just mothball it, we need to cancel it so we can get on with their lives. Yeah. I'll also leave one, one slight point. We have destroyed 400 homes in Rother Valley. At the same time, Rotherham Council is building on the green belt to build new homes. This is ridiculous. We are destroying homes we've got, and we're now building on the green belt to make up for this loss. This HS2 project is a disaster, and 2B needs to be cancelled fully. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sticking to uh, time, and thank you to Mr Newlands, who has uh, reduced his uh, time available so that other members could uh, participate in the debate. So I call Gavin Newlands. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Mandela. It's, uh, it's, it's strange, but indeed a pleasure to see you in the chair um, this evening. Um, and it's been a, an excellent debate. <laughs> it's been an excellent debate uh, with uh, impassioned contributions from both sides, but clearly skewed towards one side um, of the debate. And I don't have much time to reflect on any of or many of those speeches, but I would like to single out the, the Transport Select Committee face-off. Uh, <laughs> Between my colleagues on the, the committee, the members for High Peak and, and Buckingham, uh, I'm sure it will be discussed tomorrow um, in committee. Uh, but the fact that it took the UK so long to reinvest in rail after decades of deinvestment and line closures and to attempt to offer a, a much more realistic alternative to domestic flying is to be regretted. In fact, there's an argument to be made that given the changed working practices that have been born out of the COVID pandemic, the HS2 is perhaps already uh, too late. However, in principle, uh, we remain in favour of high-speed rail with the Scottish Government recognising economic benefit that a, a well-planned and well-delivered project could bring. Uh, we would also look to have, uh, eventually have high-speed rail, I've, I've already half my, speak, my, my speech, I'm afraid. Uh, we would also look to eventually have high-speed rail all the way to Glasgow and Edinburgh. And so I wonder if the Minister in his summing up would tell us by what year high-speed rail will be delivered to the border. The Scottish Secretary couldn't answer this question last week. All of that said, as a, an England-only project, HS2 falls within the remit of the UK Government and oversight by uh, English MPs. The SNP do not uh, usually attempt to interfere with devolved decision-making for England unless there are budget implications for Scotland. And whilst we support the principle that the HS2 project, I think it's fair to say, has now regressed and become short-sighted and has not placed proper emphasis on connectivity across these islands, the fact that there's no discussion to link up to Wales directly, whilst not even giving the Welsh Assembly any Barnet consequentials, is quite frankly shameful. Uh, as an England-only national infrastructure project, HS2 does deliver spending consequentials to Scotland, and I'd like the Minister to confirm that this will continue to be the case to enable the Scottish Government to continue to build the carbon-neutral transport infrastructure for Scotland. And as the cost of HS2 continues to increase, UK ministers must ensure that all devolved nations are not left out of pocket due to their decision to spend so much on one project in England. We're also not oblivious to the environmental issues that many of us, even Scottish MPs, have been inundated with. It's important that any work on HS2 takes into consideration the wider environmental impact. And as we've heard from many members tonight, this certainly hasn't been the case uh, thus far. Uh, the Scottish Government is, of course, looking to decarbonise Scotland's transport network through decarbonising rail, investing uh, in green buses and public transport. And Scotland's electrification scheme is an ongoing exemplar to the rest of these islands, in particular the DFT, who have electrified lines at half the pace of the Scottish Government over the last 20 years or so. <clears throat> uh, we're also looking at uh, we're beginning the process of beginning ScotRail into public ownership with a view to creating a rail network that works for the people of Scotland and not just private profit. In Scotland and the other devolved administrations have robust processes for identifying investment priorities, each setting their own strategies and priorities for transport. Because transport infrastructure is, as you know, Mr Mandel, devolved. Decisions on investment were taken by the Scottish Government through an infrastructure investment plan and the second strategic transport projects review. Uh, we'll consider infrastructure proposals which are founded upon robust evidence and which support the vision and outcomes of that strategy and meet the needs uh, of the people and businesses of Scotland, not 
the political whimsy of the Prime Minister, whose track record in this area is nothing short of calamitous. And the Minister has said previously, and will no doubt say again today, that the HS2 connectivity will benefit the whole of the UK. So therefore, I think it's important to make the point in conclusion, Mr Mundell, a point which I know you wouldn't agree with if you were this side in the, in the <laughs> chamber today, but the impartial chair today, but the Union Connectivity Review was established without any meaningful discussion with devolved administrations and undermines devolution. The UK Government is now threatening to withhold funding to Scotland unless the Scottish Government signs up to the review, which was carried out without Scottish Government input, shows that the, the review is not about collaboration, but rather about the UK Government inserting itself into devolved areas of government. The UK Government must respect the devolution settlement and stop undermining it for the single purpose of being able to put Union Jacks on Scottish projects. Thank you indeed. I am neutral in this debate, so I will now move on to call a Tan Manjit to sing Desai for eight minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Mandel, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And my gratitude also to honourable members uh, who have spoken so passionately and eloquently today uh, on what I know can be a very divisive and emotive issue for our constituents. I know honourable members here today have put forward their well-considered views on what is such an important topic for the future of our transport system. And I know those that have signed this petition have important concerns which must be addressed. Whilst I believe HS2 should continue to be built and built in full, I feel government has failed to address such concerns adequately. Today's debate, Mr Mundell, comes at a very important time for the HS2 project. A year today, formal construction on the project began, building from London to Birmingham, rather than starting from the north, as Labour advocated. In that time, HS2 has launched two giant tunnel boring machines, provided 20,000 jobs and much more besides. And it has taken over a decade to get to this point. Back in 2009, a Labour government announced the birth of this project in the face of growing rail usage for both passengers and freight caused by, and I quote, passenger choice, better rail services, road congestion and environmental factors with the project aiming to cut journey times and, crucially, increase capacity substantially. And until recently, this remained unchanged. Between June 2018 and June 2019, the number of passenger journeys reached a staggering 1.77 billion. So naturally, as home working became the norm, questions arose around HS2, as honourable and right honourable members have highlighted today. But meaning one of the main critiques um, from this petition is the substantial impact of the pandemic. There is no denying that the past 18 months have had a substantial impact on rail. And its lowest uh, last year, levels dipped to a mere 4% in comparison to the norm. And as people tentatively return to offices, many have chosen to drive over using our railways with train commuting at just 33% of 2019 levels. But the answer, Mr Mundell, is not to give up and end construction. Abandon the pro progress HS2 could make on decarbonising billions of passenger and freight miles. Yes, I shall. I wonder if the honourable gentleman were in receipt of the 85 megabits of documentation from whistleblowers within HS2 and the Department of Transport, which indicated that phase one now is unlikely to be open for passengers before 2041, and the whole project is going to be £160 billion in today's money. Phase one is already £70 billion, and the enabling works are running massively over budget. They're being suppressed, and that's going to be thrown into the main budget at the end. I very much thank my honourable friend, and uh, I think that he has made the point that I uh, have made thus far, but also will continue to make within my speech, namely that the government has not got a grip of the project. And it is right that the uh, opinions, or whether it's whistleblowers or others within the industry and within our communities, is taken into account because we cannot have ballooning costs and we must ensure that the project is delivered in full, but also within budget. Um, uh, and, and Mr uh, Mundell, as I was saying, we cannot abandon the progress that HS2 could make on decarbonising billions of passenger and, as uh, honourable members have pointed out, freight miles. We cannot reverse the construction progress made or the jobs created. It is to make our railways 
work better for passengers, it means committing to HS2 in full, including the eastern leg to Leeds, and I know that people, uh, especially in the East uh, Midlands and the North, feel very passionately about that, and, and the people that I have spoken to uh, in and around Leeds, it is to ensure that connectivity at HS2 stations uh, for onward travel, whether, whether that's bus stops, taxi ranks, or park and ride, actually making flexible season tickets flexible, reducing delays, improving our rolling stock, guaranteeing they are modern, clean and accessible. It is to address the issues which, which the project effectively uh, uh, and it should be run efficiently, like those raised on the local environment and local communities through the construction of HS2. And as I'm sure uh, the Minister is aware, I am not alone uh, in these concerns. I know my honourable friend, the member for Oxford East, has written to him on the issue of ancient woodlands and the environmental impact of HS2, as well as on behalf of her constituents, uh, about the uncertainty around the project. Uh, uh, I will very briefly, please. Thank you, and thank you for giving way. Just to speak on behalf of the people of Denham um, and the ancient woodlands in, in Denham Regional Park and also Colm Valley, there's been destruction there, both to the ancient woodlands and to the aquifer, and I just ask those, we are at the coal face to remember the environmental damage that is being done. Um, I, I thank my honourable friend, and uh, the reason why I, uh, I gave uh, way to, Ms., uh, to her, Mr. Mandel, is as well as indicating is uh, she is uh, my neighbour, and I know that uh, uh, on behalf of her constituents, she wanted to get those things on record. Uh, and it, it, in fact, uh, uh, I agree with her to the extent that when I last spoke in Parliament extensively on this matter, it was when the government accepted Labour's uh, amendments on these two key issues to report on the impact on our ancient woodland in order to protect it and to properly consult with local communities. So I hope the Minister is mindful of these two important factors uh, in the continued construction of HS2. Ultimately, it is uh, those in the villages, towns and cities along the route who will know best about the environmental and logistical issues that it will bring. Prioritising engagement and transparency is the best way to deliver this project. Mr. Mandel, to encourage even more people to travel by rail as one of the least polluting mass transport forms, rail should be the most convenient, affordable, and connected. We cannot lose sight of the initial reason for building this project. If we fail to provide these solutions for passengers, then they will simply resort to more polluting and convenient forms of travel. Just last week, uh, I will, and this is definitely the last intervention. Uh, briefly, please. Does he agree that given the scale of um, the numbers attending today and the scale of the project, this sort of debate is worthy of the main chamber and for much longer? Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend. And yes, I, I am always more than happy to engage in a debate within the main chamber. And uh, given the, the level of um, uh, excitement and passion within uh, many right, right honourable members, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the government and indeed uh, the Leader of the House should be looking very uh, closely at that. Uh, just last week, Mr. Mundell, the Rail Delivery Group warned that a further 20% shift from rail to roads will lead to an increase of some 300 million hours of tra uh, traffic congestion. We cannot allow the pandemic to push us backwards in the plight to decarbonise transport. And the impact of returning commuters and building HS2 is wider than just transport, with £30 billion in high street spending crucial for keeping businesses open in our towns uh, and city centres. Indeed, many businesses and commuters have made crucial plans around the guarantee of HS2 being delivered, and government have promised that this will stimulate the economy and rebalance the north-south divide. But continued failures from government to properly commit to the eastern leg to Leeds paints a very different pic a picture. No integrated rail plan, no northern powerhouse rail, no eastern leg. Does the minister think that this is good enough? Siemens, Hitachi, Alstom, Acom. Um, uh, ACOM, British Steel, Mace and Babcock, uh, Bab Babcock and many other businesses certainly don't. This week they noted that scaling back the line would have a devastating impact on confidence in the industry and that it will be uh, the communities in those regions who we most let down should the eastern leg not move forward. So I would welcome the Minister to address this in his response. Government's usual dither and delay just won't cut it because it's a very mismanagement of HS2, Mr. Mundell, which has left government contemplating this uh, decision to abandon those promises. Ballooning costs and persistent delays, which have become characteristic of this government, have hurt communities 
uh, leading to uh, some losing their confidence in such a project. And so that's why I would urge the government and HS2 to get a grip of this. So whilst the Labour Party stands behind the completion of HS2, this does not mean that, that concerns from constituents can be ignored. And I hope that the Minister has listened today and will provide some concrete reassurance on the environment, costs and business case uh, for HS2 because if we do not uh, commit to HS2 in full, significantly increase capacity in, the, in our network and encourage this seismic shift towards rail, then our fair net zero may be out of reach uh, and communities uh, will be left behind. And we must ensure that the government uh, delivers, therefore, Mr Mundell, on its promises. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call the Minister and if you can ensure that we have a, a minute at the end uh, for Ms Umatami to respond to the debate. Well, thank you, Mr Mundell. It is a real pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I start by thanking the Honourable Member for Coventry North West for opening this debate and the contributions of many Honourable and Right Honourable Members. Uh, can I start by saying that I welcome the continued public scrutiny of the high-speed rail programme and will address some of the key issues raised during uh, this debate, although it's worth noting I probably only have about seven minutes left to reply. <laughs> <laughs> yes, briefly. Called in the debate, but I think he knows already my strong opposition to the scheme. But just one of the points that was raised, and I wonder if I just press him and ask him about the benefit cost ratio, because the OCA review said it was 2.2 and uh, sorry, 2.3. Sorry, it dropped from originally 2.3 down to 1.1. And post pandemic, we can expect that to come down even further. So, would he not agree that we need to have another uh, review of this so we can properly assess the value of the scheme? I thank my honourable friend for that point. Uh, the benefit cost ratio is something that I'm going to get to if I get there in time. The last benefit cost ratio for this scheme was, of course, published when the last full business case was published. It was in April uh, 2020. Uh, I think it's worth saying um, this is a long-term investment in the future of our country, and we shouldn't be basing investment, long-term investment decisions on what's been happening over the 18 months. But I will try to get there. Yes. I'm one of those who has deep scepticism about the value for money of this project and also can think of considerable other ways to invest that money that would have a much stronger economic benefit. But just looking at this issue about the impact of COVID and the pandemic, has he not considered the long-term impact of the growing use of Zoom, of electronic communications and so on? Surely any sensible government would look at the impact of that and on travel, on business travel, on commuter travel and so on as part of this project. Well, I thank the Right Honourable Lady for her point. Of course, the government is looking at this, and we are looking at this in a cross-government way, looking at changing work patterns, because that has impacts not just on transport investment, but regeneration, and a whole range of things. Uh, we are saying more about our thinking in the coming months, and certainly, as we said in the Queen's speech, we intend to bring forward a Western Leg Bill. Obviously, that would have to be accompanied with uh, future projections for the, the whole network as well as Western Leg. So I hope that we will be publishing more information on that uh, in the very near time. I look forward to him publishing more information. Also looking forward to the integrated rail plan that uh, he knows uh, I'm keen to see uh, with recommendations to scrap the Goulburn spur leg uh, which impacts on my constituency in Warrington. It's a two, million, a two billion pound line that basically goes nowhere and it brings all the pain and no gain to Warrington. Can I ask him to prioritise scrapping that? Thank you, Mr Mundell. My uh, honourable friend, the member for Warrington South, along with um, his colleague, the honourable member, for, my honourable friend from Lee, uh, continue to push me on the Goulburn Spur. Uh, that is one of the many decisions that will be taken as part of the inter integrated rail plan. So uh, I hope to be able to say more on that soon. I thank the minister for giving way. Uh, the point I made earlier about my constituents, uh, Darren Bartlett and his colleagues, uh, who are now stuck in a straitjacket, where financial straitjacket, both economically and personally, uh, are not able to move on because the funding has been made forward, uh, available by HS2 management in Birmingham. Will he meet with them and, and, and explore how we can actually uh, move this issue uh, a lot further forward? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for the point. I will uh, be happy to meet with him to discuss this issue. Um, I've, after doing the Land and Property Review shortly after I became a Minister, looking at a number of these tricky cases, I now on a fortnightly basis review all the cases that are brought to my attention by Honourable and Right Honourable Members. So I'm more than happy to add his case to the list, but also meet with him personally to see if we can uh, find a way forward. Uh, really one last time. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for giving way and also like to thank him for coming to Marsden in my constituency to meet constituents. That's on the Trans-Pennine route 
Can we just get rid of a myth here this evening? Investment in HS2 isn't instead of, it's as well as upgrading the trans Pennine route, as well as Northern Powers Rail, as well as local infrastructure, and we can only get all of the benefits if Eastern Leg is delivered, as well as all those investments, improving jobs, improving connectivity, improving the environment, and it's good for our constituents. I agree with my honourable friend, the member for Colm Valley. Um, as I've got about two minutes left, uh, Mr Chairman, I just have to say, so HS2 at the moment is going full steam ahead. This is a railway that we hope the country can be proud of for many generations to come. Construction has now begun in earnest with over 300 active construction sites along the line of route from Birmingham to London. And this year we've achieved significant milestones and the momentum behind the project is growing. Today, for example, we announced that HS2 is now supporting over 20,000 jobs just one year on since the Prime Minister declared the formal start of construction on the Birmingham to London stretch of the route. And this year we will be celebrating many brilliant feats of engineering, including the start of tunnelling with our two tunnel boring machines under the Chilterns, having now tunnelled more than 1.5 kilometres underground. And many members have expressed uh, various uh, concerns. I'm more than happy to meet with them uh, after the debate. I know that HS2 is a project that inspires strong feelings on all sides, as do all major infrastructure projects. Uh, all honourable and right honourable members present here this evening know that the government very carefully considered the merits of proceeding with HS2, and HO, HS2 uh, has almost certainly been subject to more parliamentary scrutiny than any other infrastructure project. Our firm conclusion was that HS2 should go ahead, and it is now progressing as I outlined earlier. In setting out this decision to proceed, we made clear, uh, a clear commitment to draw a line under past problems, this is a once-in-a-generation major infrastructure project which will shape this country for well over 100 years, showcasing our skills in engineering and construction. Um, there were many, many uh, comments that came up in the day. My right honourable friend, the member for Kenilworth and uh, Southam, made a very reasonable speech, and I look forward to visiting his constituency next week. The Honourable Lady for York raised her concerns about regeneration plans around York Station. I, I, I heard about those plans when I visited the National Railroad Museum, but I'm more than happy to meet with her to talk more in more depth about that. My honourable friend, the member for Buckingham, has made consistent his opposition to HS2. I was grateful for him taking time to introduce me to some of his councillors and residents recently. The member for Cheshire and Amersham raised uh, concerns about community engagement, the aquifer and bentonite. Uh, let me be clear, Mr Mundell, ensuring the continued uh, supply of high quality drinking water from the Chilterns aquifer is a high priority and I'd be happy to meet with the Honourable Lady. Uh, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Stone, may clear his opposition to HS2 but also his desire to see changes to Phase 2A. I I'm happy to continue to engage with him on the changes he would like to see. The member for Blakely and Broughton uh, made some very valid points about the opposition uh, infrastructure projects have always attracted over the years, and I thank him for his support in pushing ahead. The Honourable Member for Aylesbury raised some concerns on behalf of his local constituents, uh, as he has been doing consistently since he's been elected, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with him to mitigate those impacts. I think, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give way to the uh, Honourable Lady, the mover of the motion. Thank you. You couldn't answer. Will you please write and give the full answer? Thank I'm you. happy to commit to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. And with sincere apologies to everyone who was not able to be called because of the shortness of time, as uh, Ms. Uh, McVeigh pointed uh, out, can I call uh, Ms. Owatami to uh, conclude this uh, debate? Thank you, Mr. Mandel. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in such an important debate. And, and I think that what we've heard from today reflects how difficult it has been to strike a balance between achieving high-speed rail and managing that ambition in a genuinely clean, green, and mostly cost-effective way. Indeed, I echo concerns raised by the member for Brighton Pavilion and many members in this house about the devastating environmental impact that HS2 is currently having, with over 15 hectares already utterly destroyed. Likewise, I would like to highlight concerns raised by the Honourable Member for Aylesbury about the environmental and economic issues associated with the Wendover section of HS2. The off and rejection of the Wendover Tunnel proposal has demonstrated the need for the government to actually call upon an independent investigation for what is truly the more environmentally friendly and cost-efficient mechanism for building sections of the railway should its construction continue. So I look forward to seeing the steps the government um, will take in response to all the points that have been raised today. And I think many 
colleagues today for joining me in this debate. And finally, I'd like to thank Mr. Mundell for chairing this debate. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 563380 relating to HS2. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order. The sitting stands adjourned.